Well, good evening again, and thanks for joining uh, for an informative webinar tonight hosted by uh, NCBA. This is Josh White. I lead the producer education and sustainability team here, and we're happy to have Zoetis sponsoring a very timely discussion around some changing guidance for industry from the FDA, guidance for industry number 191 that uh, recently put more definition around production phases for beef cattle and how we um, treat those production phases related to growth implants and how those implants can be used. I'm uh, very happy to be joined by two in industry experts tonight, but before I introduce them, just uh, want to remind everyone that your line's muted. Um, but you can chat in questions in the chat box or the question box. We usually suggest the questions tab there on your screen in the toolbar. We'll be doing some q and I'll come back at the end uh, to, to uh, moderate questions and answers. So feel free to be chiming in with those throughout the webinar and we'll get to them at the end as time allows. And also um, we are recording the webinar. So if you uh, if you're unable to start for the or stay on for the entire time or if you have any technical technological issues, um, you will be able to come back in and watch that uh, or come back and and get the pieces you might have missed. Again, we have two great uh, guys that are out boots on the ground with customers every day, part of Zoetis's beef strategic technical services team, both PhD nutritionist, Dr. Brian Bernhard, who um, supports customers in Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Kansas. He was on faculty at Texas Tech in uh, both teaching and research capacity there before uh, joining uh, Zoetis. And looks like he's a born and bred Texas guy. And then Dr. Dirk Birkin, also a nutritionist with that Strategic Technical Services Division, um, serves Nebraska, Colorado, Kansas, and Missouri. He's He and I were talking ahead of this, and he's uh, in the part of central Nebraska that is not getting a lot of rain, or his family has cattle and, and ranches there. Um, PhD, again, in nutrition uh, from University of Nebraska, Lincoln, and um, these guys, like I mentioned, they've got the practical experience and also the technical expertise to share with us tonight. Um, Brian is going to start us off. I'm going to make you the presenter, Brian, and we'll let you take it away here. Well, appreciate NCBA having us. Um, thank you for this partnership and opportunity to share. Um, as uh, he alluded to, please feel free to jot down those questions along the way, and we should have ample time to answer those. So, um, really, just going to jump straight into this. Um, there was recently a uh, document published by the FDA um, that was titled uh, "FDA Provides Additional Information and Clarification on the Use of Beef Cattle Ear Implants," and, and this was put on their website on May twelfth of. 2023 um, reference there down at the bottom there's a there's this actual document and there's also a, a frequently asked questions document that accompanied this um, and you may ask you know where where did this start from some of you may be very familiar and some not as familiar um, this really goes back to um, over a year ago there was a posting regard to ear implants and and some of the statements in there I pulled out one that unless otherwise approved and labeled for reimplantation, only one ear implant may be given to an animal during a specific stage of growth. And, and for obvious reasons, this statement um, led to many questions from customers, nutritionists, veterinarians about stages of growth, how we were currently um, utilizing implants across different phases of production, and, and what would that mean going forward? A lot of curiosity. There was subsequently some other uh, documents published um, by the FDA to try to help clarify throughout 2021 and then recently um, in uh, 2023, um, so well, some two years later from the original documentation, was an additional clarification. And, and this is really, really crucial, as probably most on the call realize, just this sheer impact that 
growth promoting technologies have on the efficiency and the sustainability of the beef industry and, and, and the production aspects of these products um, on why, um, why these have been a, a, a topic um, that was very important for, for customers, nutritionists, et cetera. So today what we're gonna focus on this evening from my portion is really these key clarifications that came out just a couple of weeks ago in this most recent May document. Um, I think a couple of the main points that FDA provided some clarification on was product labeling, um, what these production phases were, their definitions as they referenced this guidance for industry 191, grow yards and how implants can be utilized in grow yards, changes in ownership or changes in location, extra label use or, or, or really no extra label use for uh, cattle, uh, for ear implants, and then a July 1st of 2023 deadline. So we're here one month away from this, this deadline and, and what does that mean? Now you'll realize I'll preface as I go through this documentation, I, I typically, as I prepare slides, I have some key points on each slides and I, I'd have more discussion and or pictures. These slides are a little unorthodox for me. As we see, as you go through there, there will be more complete sentences and, and, and a few more words than I normally create. Um, as this first sentence, you see it's in quotations, probably 85 or 90% of my slides have statements on them that are in quotations. Um, because I wanted it to be clear that um, what I'm presenting this evening isn't my interpretation of their document. It's not a, um, a Zoetis viewpoint of this document. I'm trying just to be as transparent as possible to say, hey, this is what the document says. I've tried to pull out some highlights that I think are most pertinent um, to our customers, to, uh, to the beef industry. So all of these statements that are in quotations, just like this first one, these are um, word for word quotations um, that I've pulled out of the document as I referenced on that first slide um, from, the, from the, the recent update and clarification document. So in regards to product labeling, they made a couple comments here that I wanted to point out is that currently there's some cattle ear implants that are approved for reimplantation within a production phase. And those products clearly state that on the labeling. I'll show you an example in just a minute. There's another group of uh, products, uh, cattle ear implants, that clearly state that reimplantation within a production phase is not permitted. And then the third one is, unless a cattle ear implant clearly states on the labeling that they are approved for reimplantation within a production phase, they are not approved. So, and this was bolded in their document. That's why it's bolded on my slide. So. Uh, bottom line is the implants either say they are approved for reimplantation or they're not. And if the label doesn't say anything, that means they're not approved for reimplantation. So give me an example. These are some examples of some Cinevex products. This is the full label for Cinevex Choice. Um, the important piece I'm trying to draw out of here is actually in blue highlighted there in the middle. Um, it says for increased rate of weight gain up to 200 days and growing beef steers and heifers in confinement for slaughter in a reimplantation program. So you can see right here it says these this product, Cinevex Choice, is approved in a reimplantation program. And then it's very specific where Cinevex Choice is the first implant, and then Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus, or Cinevex One feedlot is administered. 60 to 120 days later. So you can have a first implant and then a second implant or, or most would refer to this second implant as a terminal implant. So this is an example of a product that specifically says reimplantation um, is approved for Cinevex Choice. Here's another Cinevex product, Cinevex One Grower. Um, this is a product that has kind of a unique label um, it's approved for growing beef steers and heifers on pasture. So you can use it in the pasture production phase. It's also approved for growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. So you can use it in the confinement production phase. Those are two different production phases we'll cover here in just a minute. But then it goes on to add this, um, I'd say relatively newer statement. Um, it says not approved for repeated implantation. So re-implantation 
with this or any other cattle in, ear implant within a specific phase. So um, it's saying you can use it in pasture and you can use it in confinement, but within a single phase, you can't use it as a re-implant program, meaning you can't give two implants in pasture or two implants in confinement with this product. So um, it is approved across two different phases and, and could be used once in each phase or in either phase, um, but you cannot re-implant. So you'll probably see this on, on multiple products um, across the industry going forward where it has some statement. We already see this in some other products. Uh, this is a Zoetis one and some competitor products that say um, they're not approved for repeated implantation within a specific phase. So those are just some examples of some products that are approved for uh, a re-implant program and some products that are not approved in a re-implant program within a specific phase. So FDA defines these phases. You may be thinking, well, what are these stages of growth? What are these phases of production? Some may be more familiar with that. They define these phases with this document called Guidance for Industry or GFI 191. Um, within this document, if you go to about page 23 or four, there's an appendix three, um, target animal classes of major food animals in which they outline these different classes or production phases of, uh, for, for, all, for all cattle, but specifically today, we're gonna to talk about beef cattle. And I wanna make it very clear that, that these production phases or these different classes of animals were not um, just um, developed specific for implants. These, uh, this document covers all species, this document also is, is applicable for, for all different types of pharmaceutical products. So this actually isn't a brand new document. Um, it's been around for a while. Um, within cattle, they break up uh, these different uh, subclasses of veal calves, beef cattle, which includes calves, steers, heifers, bulls, cows, and then dairy cattle. For this evening's presentation and, and, and relative to implants, we're gonna specifically talk about beef cattle. Um, as they work through the different um, growth stages or the stages of life um, from conception through harvest and, and how those phases, uh, production phases um, outline. So within beef calves, they have two variants. Uh, variant is a word they use um, interchangeably for production phases. Um, they consider beef calves to be beef cattle nursing their dams from birth until weaning. They may be pre-ruminating or ruminating says formally referred to as suckling beef calves. I'll also remind you, even as I go through these production phases, these are, these are production phases or these are um, definitions that I've copied and pasted from their published documents. These, these aren't my definitions, um, just trying to put them in a little bit more palatable version on some slides instead of, instead of combing through a, a, a long extensive document. So those two uh, variants for beef calves are less than two months of age and over two months of age. They consider the ones under two months of age to be pre-ruminating, their rumen's not developed yet, um, but over two months of age to be a ruminating animal. So that's two production phases. As you look at growing beef steers and heifers, they actually have three variants or three production phases. And so these growing beef steers and heifers, they consider to be weaned, castrated males or female cattle. They can be of beef or dairy breeds. Obviously at this point, um, um, you know, some of the dairy or dairy cross breeds would be intended for, for harvest and, and not being kept as replacements. Um, they can be housed in, in a variety of settings, receiving their diets from multiple sources. Um, so those variants, as we look at this um, table, on the left hand side, variant number one is growing beef steers and heifers on pasture. So this is the first production phase on pasture and then they define it here on the right hand side. So wean growing beef steers and heifers receiving or maintained on pasture receiving the majority of their diet from grazing. So that one's pretty straightforward I believe. Um, they're on pasture, they're receiving the majority of their their diet from grazing and their house on pasture. The second one would be beef growing steers and heifers in a dry lot. Um, this says wean growing beef steers and heifers maintained in a dry lot. They receive the majority of their diet from harvested forage. 
they may receive a supplement. So it, it's possible to supplement those cattle um, if it's needed. So phase number one is pasture. Phase number two here is dry lot. The third one within growing beef, steers, and heifers is actually the uh, confinement phase. So when you look at this, it says growing beef, steers, and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. That's there on the left-hand side, and I'll grab the, the pointer again. And that definition is a, is a wean growing beef steer heifer intended for slaughter in confinement group pens, fed up progressively high energy diet as their sole ration. But they make a couple key points here at the end. May also be referred to as feed yard or feedlot cattle in the industry, includes growing beef steers and heifers in a grow yard, see definition below. And so this is how it's laid out in their document. You look at the definition below, Growing beef steers and heifers in a grow yard are actually a subset population of growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. These are wean growing beef steers fed in group pens, fed a moderate to high roughage diet as their sole ration prior to the finishing stage. Grow yards may also be referred to as starter yards or backgrounding yards in the industry. So essentially what they're saying, and, and they outlined it in this most recent clarification that if it's a starter yard or a grow yard or a backgrounding yard or a feed yard, those are all considered part of this one production phase, which is growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. So um, this is all one production phase. Um, they also had a couple clarifying statements about grow yards in their document just a couple of weeks ago, um, as I guess they've received some questions. Um, they defined uh, grow yards as growing beef steers and heifers in a grow yard as a subset population, as I just mentioned, to the production phase, growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. The last part of this statement was the key is um, the grow yard is a subset of confinement regardless of whether they are co-located on the feed yard or housed in a separate facility. So um, it doesn't matter if that grow yard is um, within a, uh, a certain pen within a broader feedlot or if they're housed in a separate facility altogether, um, FDA considers a grow yard to be a subset population of the confinement for slaughter um, production phase. They also stated that a change in ration, i.e. Uh, uh, fed a progressively higher energy diet is not a change in production phase. So just because you change the ration, is in a change in production phase. Um, and they went on to say, as they were referencing implanting cattle within a grow yard, that you could administer an implant to, a, uh, to an animal within a grow yard um, if it's an implant that's approved for use in the confinement production phase. But cattle that receive an implant during the grow yard portion may not receive a subsequent implant unless the implants used are approved and labeled for use in a re-implant program within this production phase, growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. So um, this was bolded in their document. That's why I bolded here that, um, that uh, uh, once again, just reiterating that, that those are one and the same. Those are one phase uh, in confinement, whether they're in a grow yard or a feed yard or start yard, et cetera. So this is really a summary of those production phase, trying to boil those last six or so slides down to just one, is that essentially uh, FDA in, in guidance document 191 identifies five production phases or five variants. They have calves that are less than two months of age, calves over two months of age, growing beef, steers, and heifers, on pasture, that's number three, growing beef steers and heifers in a dry lot, number four, and then the last one being growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter. You can see there I've put in parentheses underneath, including a start yard, background yard, grow yard, and feedlot. Those are all part of one phase. Um, but then their recent document in, um, in May said, although there's five production phases, they made this statement that's at the bottom of the screen. And this is, a, this is a, an excerpt from that document. There are currently three beef target animal production phases. So there's currently three phases that FDA describes in Appendix 3 
that have one or more cattle ear implants approved for use in them. So essentially what they're saying is relative to implants, there's really three production phases that have products approved. There's the suckling calf phase or, or, or the calf phase. There's this pasture phase. And then there's this confinement phase. Those are the three phases that have products approved in which we can utilize implants um, to implant um, cattle. And you may be thinking, well, what about this phase number four? What about this dry lot phase? It is a separate phase of production, um, but currently there's no products approved for that phase. Um, so that's why it leaves us with only three production phases that currently have products approved um, for use in them. And that would be the suckling calves, the pasture and confinement. Another question that has come up is, is what about change in ownership? What about change in location? Um, they did clarify in this document recently that cattle producers should note that although the FDA um, does not define a change in production phase as a change in ownership or location, these changes may be accompanied by a change in production phase. Also some questions that came up about extra label use if any of these um, implants in the future would be prescription type products, would that give a um, um, would that give the veterinarian an opportunity to write some prescription to use these implants um, in a manner that was uh, not aligned with the label or you know could a veterinarian use current products um, in a manner on a prescription basis um, extra labely or, or not aligned with the label and so they had a couple comments in their document about that. Um, veterinarians must follow all federal regulations addressing the extra label use of drugs and animals as detailed by FDA regulations. The use of growth promoting cattle ear implants in an extra label manner, including those with a prescription or an RX marketing status, does not comply with these requirements. And it would be uh, an illegal extra label use may cause a drug to be adulterated under the FDNC Act and subject to possible enforcement. And so they had some, uh, a, a couple of comments there. I tried to pull out the highlights of that, um, you know, stating that, that implants, since they have a growth claim, not a, not a health claim, um, that growth promoting products are, are not able to be used in an extra label manner um, in, in compliance with these FDA regulations. Another piece that was addressed in, in this most recent update was July 1st, 2023. That's been the deadline for um, these pharmaceutical companies to make some label changes. Also was the deadline published um, back in 2021 um, in terms of the industry having some um, adaptation time to consider current implant programs and to um, learn and go through make sure everybody was clear on, on, on what the rule changes were or, or what the uh, production phases were, et cetera. Um, cattle that were implanted or re-implanted prior to July 1st would not be considered adulterated. They also made a statement that per their December letter in, in uh, 2021, that FDA expects that beginning July 1st, 2023, so in a month from now, Producers should re-implant cattle only if the cattle ear implants that are explicitly labeled for use in a re-implantation program for that specific phase. So I think that's a really important piece that, that um, um, we're 30 days out from July 1st, but um, producers should only re-implant cattle with cattle ear implants that explicitly label they are approved for use in re-implant programs um, within that specific stage of production. So to summarize my piece before I hand it off to Dr. Birkin, um, FDA did publish these documents to clarify implant questions from the industry. Um, they are publicly available documents. Um, they addressed a few things like use in grow yards, changes in ownership or location, extra label use, and the July 1st deadline. They also um, did clarify that FDA um, does currently uh, there are only implant products approved for three production phases relative to implants, and that would be for the calf phase, the pasture phase, and the confinement phase. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.
hopefully there's some questions coming in. I would sure like to discuss this in more detail. And I will hand it over to Dr. Birkin. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sound great. Awesome. Thank you. And I want to thank all the viewers tonight and in the future for tuning into this. And I hope that you gain some valuable information from our talk tonight. So for my part of the talk this evening, I will be discussing label changes to some of our Cinevex products, as well as discuss the differences in performance and profitability between uh, using long acting implant programs compared to reimplant programs within feed yard cattle. Although the broader industry became aware in 2021 of these changes to the implant marketplace, as Brian had alluded to, some of these changes were occurring even before then. If we look at the most recent implant approvals that have hit the, the beef industry in the marketplace, we see that this goes back all the way to 2017 with the approvals of Revlar XR and Revlar XH, as well as Cinevex One Grower in 2021, as these were the most recent implants that hit the market. And all of these approvals uh, came with re-implant contraindications on their labels. When it comes to Zoetis and Zoetis's commitment to implants and implant technology for the beef industry, we really view implants as extremely valuable to the beef industry. These are products that are extremely green and from a sustainability standpoint, really use our land and resources uh, very efficiently. Zoetis is extremely committed to this space. In 2015, Zoetis completed a $26 million investment in US manufacturing facilities to manufacture our Cinevex implant line. And really when the decision had to be made of whether or not to pursue uh, re-implant label approvals, Zoetis made a decision to really go after re-implant approvals to protect the technology and re-implant uh, and, and protect the ability to re-implant uh, for the cattle industry. So late summer of last year, Zoetis received approvals for new indications on three Cinevex products, Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus, and Cinevex One Feedlot. I will show the labels or the, the additional portions of all three labels tonight. Here is the newest indication for Cinevex Choice. So now Cinevex Choice can be used for increased rate of weight gain for up to 200 days and growing beef steers and heifers fed in confinement for slaughter in a re-implant program where choice, Cinevex Choice is the first implant, and Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus, or Cinevex One Feedlot is administered 60 to 120 days later. Here's the newest indication for Cinevex Plus. Once again, it reads much the same as Cinevex Choice. However, that Cinevex Plus must be administered in re-implant program after Cinevex Choice uh, with 60 to 120 days in between those two implant products. Finally, here is the newest indication on the label for Cinevex One Feedlot. Once again, this product can be used for increased rate of weight gain up to 200 days in both steers and heifers, where Choice is the first implant, and Cinevex One Feedlot is administered 60 to 120 days later. With all three of these new indications and new label changes on these products, we also received a contraindication, a re-implant contraindication on all three of these labels as well. So in summary, we now have approved re-implant indications for use in cattle and confinement for slaughter with Cinevex Choice as the initial implant and then 60 to 120 days later, after the initial Cinevex choice, cattle producers can come back and give a Cinevex choice, a Cinevex plus, or Cinevex one feedlot. 
I will now move on to the data uh, discussing or comparing reimplant programs to long duration implants. And this is really a question that we, we receive a lot from customers. And it really depends on the situation and the, the customer operations um, as far as which program fits their, their program best. However, tonight I think it's important to, for me to go over what the research says in terms of performance and potential profitability comparing Cinevex, comparing reimplant programs to long duration implants. So if we look at the data in, in, the, in the literature, we see that there's five studies comparing Cinevex Choice, a Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus reimplant program compared to Revlar XS. So these are five large, large pen commercial studies uh, that were conducted in some major uh, cattle feeding states. And these, these five studies encompassing uh, 6,500 head of steers were then analyzed as a five study pooled analysis uh, with the fixed effect of, of treatment. So uh, these cattle were 750 pounds at initial, at initial arrival to the feed yard and were on feed for 170 days. These trials would have been conducted uh, around 2010 to 2012. So if we look at the results of these five studies, this pooled analysis, we see that from a live standpoint, a Cinevex Choice Cinevex Plus reimplant program improved final body weight by 13 pounds compared to Revlar XS. This was also accompanied by an improvement in average daily gain and a 2.7% improvement in feed conversion. From a carcass standpoint, there is a tendency for an improvement in hot carcass weight to the tune of seven pounds of hot carcass weight. If we look at more carcass characteristics, we see that a Cinevex Choice Cinevex Plus reimplant program does reduce some quality grades, some prime and choice percentage compared to Revlar XS, with prime and choice being decreased by about six points across these five studies. I do wanna make note that these studies, like I mentioned before, were conducted between 2010 and 2012 when we weren't feeding cattle quite as long or as fat uh, as we do today. If you look at this prime and choice percentage, we see that um, prime and choice was sub 60% in these studies versus today we're 88, 80 to 85%. So um, I really think that if we would re redo these studies today, that uh, maybe that difference in prime and choice between these two treatments would not be as dramatic. If we look at yield grades across these two treatments, we see that the reimplant program uh, resulted in leaner cattle compared to Revlor XS as well. So in summary, Looking at the steer data, we see that a Cinevex Choice followed by Cinevex Plus reimplant program improved average daily gain by about 2.2%, improved feed efficiency by 2.7%. There was a tendency for seven pounds of hot carcass weight improvement with reimplant programs, and a tendency for a 6% reduction in choice quality grade carcasses. If we put this data into a closeout calculator looking at the economics comparing reimplant programs to long duration implants and steers, we see that economics strongly favor reimplanting. If we look at it from a live marketing basis, we see that reimplant programs improve profitability uh, in this data set by, by about $25 using today's market values. Or if we sold these steers on a grid basis agreement, uh, using the, the assumptions in the footnote below, we see that reimplanting steers garnered another $15 a head compared to the use of a long acting implant uh, in these steers. So, a lot of profitability potential from the use of reimplant systems or reimplant protocols compared to long duration implants in steers. What about heifers? Well, we have one comparison looking at Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus reimplant 
compared to a long duration implant. And in this study, that long duration implant was a Cinevex 1 feedlot. This, steer, this study was done in central Nebraska with about, 18, about 1,700 head of heifers. These heifers were about 700 pounds and were on feed 182 days. If we look at the results of this study, we see that the Cinevex 1 feed, not the long duration implant cattle in this study, consumed a, a bit more feed compared to a Cinevex Choice Plus reimplant program. From a live weight standpoint, there was no difference in final body weight or average daily gain, but there was a trend for a slight improvement in feed conversion to the tune of 1.3% in this study. There is also a tendency for an improvement in hot carcass weight to the tune of about six pounds of hot carcass weight by using a Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus reimplant program compared to a Cinevex 1 feedlot. If we look at carcass characteristics, from a quality grade standpoint, we see that once again, long duration implants improved quality grade. However, in this heifer study, which was done where with heifers that we fed longer or more, uh, more to today's standard, we see that the reduction in choice and prime is reduced to about uh, four and a half points compared to uh, the steer data. Once again, if we look at yield grades, we see that re-implanted heifers are leaner compared to their long duration implant uh, counterparts with fours and fives, yield grade fours and fives dramatically decreased in heifers receiving a Cinevex Choice Plus reimplant program compared to those heifers receiving a Cinevex One feedlot. So in summary, looking at the heifer data, comparing a reimplant program to long acting implants, we see that from a live standpoint, there is no difference in average daily gain or final body weight. There is a, a slight improvement in feed efficiency and a tendency for five pounds of increased hot carcass weight. Once again, Cinevex 1 feedlot, the long duration implant, did improve the quality grade distribution. However, those heifers given a long duration implant were, were fatter at harvest which resulted in more yield grade fours and five discounts uh, when sold on a grid basis. If we put uh, this data into, once again, that same closeout calculator uh, with those assumptions there at the bottom of this slide, we see that economics still favor reimplanting in a heifer. On a live basis, this comes out to about $4.40 per head. And on a grid basis, there's about $20 per head to reimplant a heifer compared to using long duration implants in those heifers. I want to switch gears a little bit and uh, notify you all that Zoetis has come out with, with a new implant applicator, a new implant gun, and that is the Exact 10. We've had this out for um, a few months now and we're getting a lot of positive feedback on this gun. Uh, producers really like the, the, the cocking mechanism, the T handle cocking mechanism uh, on, the, on the back of the gun. They also like the retractable needle uh, that, that correctly places an implant in the ear. And this gun, uh, the positive feedback has been overwhelming and this, this gun can be used with any Cinevex product uh, that is on the market today. So pretty excited about this gun and, and what, what it offers producers. This will be my last slide tonight, uh, but in conclusion, I think it's incredibly important for producers to uh, understand the new changes that are coming to uh, the beef industry, the implant, market space, implant marketplace, and uh, what these regulations mean for their operation. And I also want to emphasize that July 1st of 2023 date, as it is coming quite, quite quickly. And producers need to know uh, what they need to do to get their operation uh, to be on label. 
Implants are extremely viable to our industry, and this is especially true today. And if we look across the board, what implants bring to, bring to the beef industry, it's incredible the value that these products bring to the industry. When we look specifically within, within the feed yard sector, we have documented, there is data out there that show the performance and profitability uh, advantages that, are, that lie in reimplant programs compared to long duration implants. I also wanna emphasize that there are many, many on-label options available to producers come July 1st of 2023. And Zoetis offers both uh, long acting and reimplant options to the producer for which, uh, so that producers have the option to choose which option best fits their operation. With that, I will want to say again, that uh, thank you very much for attending this this webinar tonight and uh, with that i will ask for any questions thank you all right thank you both we've got several questions in the queue i did want to just remind folks that we are uh, we do have uh, our summer business meeting coming up and it's it's open and our presenters mentioned that this is not particularly a new issue. It's one that has been uh, discussed before and, and in that regulatory space for a while. And if you've been in our Cattle Health and Wellbeing Committee uh, the last few years, you likely would have heard those discussions and how industry um, and, and our members from around the country discussed how to approach these changing regulations and how we interact with regulatory agencies. So just wanna mention that, you know, we're a grassroots driven organization. We really appreciate it when producers and engaged individuals show up. So if you, if this is part of your usual meeting cycle and you, you've joined us before, great, please register. If not, I would encourage you to reach out to your state or breed affiliate so your state cattlemen's association or if you are a purebred breeder reach out to your breed affiliate and say hey i'd, I'd like to go and uh, contribute to the committee process and the business that goes on and of course the checkoff uh, funded programs are also reviewed in this joint meeting with policy on one side and checkoff on the other doing business together as the cattle industry and it'll be in san diego california so just a quick plug for that um Let's see, we have quite a few questions that are similar in nature and folks are sharing their specific production system, but I think the overarching theme here is, um, all right, once if I choose to implant, once I ship them to the next phase of production, how is that now going to impact the ability of whoever's buying my cattle to implant? And so it may be best just to go back um, Dr. Bernhard and readdress how FDA is is slicing and dicing the regulation around the different sectors because I think there's maybe just just reemphasize um, some of what you covered early on. See if we can get that answered. Yep, I'll I'll try to answer that. And uh, for some reason, if I don't, you can you can ask me more um, specifically uh, on that, Josh. So. Um, <clears throat> I think the, to boil it down to the simplest piece, FDA identifies that there's three production phases that have implant products approved for them. You know, the, the suckling calf phase or the cow calf sector, the pasture phase, and then the confinement phase. Now, one thing I think um, FDA does realize is that the beef industry is much more uh, segmented than probably other protein production industries, meaning you know, not every animal spends seven months on a calf and then, um, you know, three or four months on pasture and then the rest of their life in confinement. There's, you know, there's some, obviously, you know, some years we have droughts and cattle get early weaned and, and go through different cycles. And some years there's plenty of rain and cattle are out on pasture longer. So, um, but in essence, there's three production phases with implants approved, suckling calf, pasture, and confinement. So. Um, if I have cattle that I'm, um, you know, if I have my own cows and I'm raising calves and keeping those all the way to finish, I could use a product that's approved for the suckling calf phase. You know, when I wean that calf, if I happen to wean him and then send him to wheat pasture, 
in the Panhandle of Texas, you know, for a few months, I can give him a pasture or a product that's approved for the pasture phase while he's out grazing wheat pasture. And when that steer comes off of wheat pasture at 850 pounds, he can go to a feed yard in Hereford, Texas, and he can get a Cinevex Choice followed by a Cinevex Plus, for example, as Dirk went through, that's an approved re-implant program within the confinement phase. So essentially, just to give you an example, um, as I'm most familiar with the Cinevex products, I could give him a Cinevex C as a suckling calf. I could give him a Cinevex One grower in the pasture phase as it has a pasture approval. And then I could give him a uh, Cinevex Choice followed by a Cinevex Plus in confinement. In essence, that, that steer would, could receive four implants um, during his life cycle. Um, all administered implants that are approved for the specific stage or the phase of production as FDA outlines it and receiving two implants in the finishing or the confinement phase per the re-implant approvals that Dr. Birkin covered. Perfect. I think that example answered most of the scenarios that we're being presented with here. And um, I think that that covered a lot of the questions. So thank you for that. That was great. Um, and I'll tell the listeners if they have something else that I didn't cover there, then you know, chime back in with another question. You should see that populate and we can be more specific if, if they have a follow up. Yeah. Another question about the labels. So labels are now saying um, re-implant up to 200 days. Does that mean you know, the cattle have to be harvested at a certain time, 200 days on feed, or what's the, you know, what's the trigger there? What's your interpretation of that, that 200 days number mean? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take that, Josh. Thank you. So um, on the label, it does say for increased rate of weight gain for up to 200 days in, in those reimplant programs. And, um, that 200 day that that verbiage is is on um, some of our long duration products as well, such as Cinevex One Feedlot, uh, as well as Reveler XS and, and Reveler XH as well. And um, that 200 days on the label is 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 on the label as that is how long um, we ran our efficacy studies uh, for these approvals. So um, to garner these approvals, we have to prove that um, a reimplant program improves weight gain um, compared to a one one implant program. So that's where that 200 days comes from on the label. It's just how long we ran our efficacy studies um, to get these approvals. I would say that much like using a, a single long duration implant, such as the Cinevex One Feedlot, a Reveler XS or a Reveler XH, um, producers can utilize those implant programs and end up feeding those cattle for 220, 230, 240 days on feed, if that makes sense. Yes, that does. But if, if you were to send those cattle to slaughter, say, after 190 days implant, you shouldn't have any problems on the flip side. Correct, correct. And, and you wouldn't have any, tr any problems either um, at, at if you decide to harvest those, harvest those cattle at 240 days or 250 days either. Okay. The, the, more, the more important portion of that label is the 60 to 120 days. So in, in those re-implant labels, you'll see that Cinevex Choice is the first implant, and then 60 to 120 days later, that Cinevex Choice, Cinevex Plus, or Cinevex One feedback can be administered. So I would pay more attention to that uh, 60 to 120 days than I would the 200 days. And Josh, you are correct. There's no withdrawal. So, uh, you know, if they if they decide to give a first implant and at day 60, they give a second implant. And if those cattle need to be harvested at day 100 or 120 or 140 or 240, uh, any of that is OK. There's no withdrawal. Um, there's no limitation on on when those animals can be harvested. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. And I, and I think you know, just past work we've done, you know, my team helping out some other teams on the checkoff side that deal with consumers and influencers and other other folks 
you know, we've long talked about the safety of implants um, and the guidance around use being more about efficacy of the product for profitability and not really called into question from a meat safety um, type of situation from a withdrawal perspective. So thanks for clearing that up. That, that was my understanding as well. Got a couple other questions here. One deals more with um, retaining ownership like a farmer feeder situation. I think the previous scenario outlined that pretty clearly that this is really not about change of ownership as much as it is about change of production sector. So I'll, I'll leave that one hanging while I go to another one and then you guys can jump back in. Um, the other question would be, you know, a lot of cattle, we don't know where they're coming from when we buy them. You know, if it's through um, through a third party or second party that's helping put together some cattle and sell them to the next user, we may not get all the information. You know, there's not always uh, traceability and or just information exchanged. So not 100% sure how those cattle were treated at a previous production phase or, you know, where they're exactly coming from. So could you address maybe some of the questions around if if producers should be making assumptions about where cattle are coming from or just treat those cattle based on the sector they live in yeah i think you kind of hit the nail on the head right there at the end um you know if i'm buying a set of cattle off a of superior auction um you know I, I may not know very much about them other than their weight, their location, and, you know, steers or heifers, or, you know, if I'm buying a set of cattle, you know, if I have a cattle buyer sitting there at the auction barn, right, and he's, he may buy ones and twos all day long to put together, you know, a load for me, and obviously they came from, you know, on that truck of 100 head um, represents 30 different, you know, cow-calf guys, uh, or, or 30 different places, so, um, you know, in, in those situations, you, you you don't know. I mean, all those ones we just described there, you honestly don't know what's happened in the past. Um, to my knowledge, FDA has not made any statements about asking, you know, you to try to figure out what's happened in the past there. I mean, obviously, that's an impossible at this point through the auction barn scenario I described. So I think to be, you know, good stewards of this technology, um, you know, if I'm buying some calves out of an auction barn and bringing them to my feedlot, I need to focus on making sure I'm, I'm doing things on label at my feedlot. Um, you know, it's a probably a different situation if if I own a feed yard and then I own the grow yard that's right across the street and I control both of those entities, you know, then obviously I know what happened from 500 to 800 pounds because they were under my ownership, they were under my care, et cetera. Um, but I mean, if, if you're just buying a set of calves out of Florida and they came out of some sale barns and they're coming all the way to Texas, um, there's just no way to know that. And so I think, you know, just do the best you can with the information you have and, and control what you can in that situation would be, you know, at the feed yard or the confinement level. Excellent. Okay. And then, um, another question, I think just just probably refers back to some of those earlier slides and sounds like they're trying to get clarification around the extra label drug use issue and or prescription issuance. Um, so maybe just restate that. My understanding of, of your comments were um, that FDA does not consider implantation a candidate for extra label use, but maybe just go back to that and make sure that everybody on the call's understanding uh, correctly. Yes, sir, exactly. And I'm, I'm not a veterinarian, so please bear with me. I hope I get this appropriate, but there are some products that can be used extra labelly through the process of Amduca. Um, and not gonna get into that, but you're essentially right. I mean, you are exactly right. Products that have a growth promotion claim um, like implants, they improve average daily gain or feed efficiency. Those products do not fit within that Amduca uh, model or that Aduca approval process. So 
Yes, the short answer is implants cannot be used extra labelly. So a veterinarian cannot write a prescription to use uh, an implant program extra labelly. Great, I think that it's about as clear as we can be on that one. So uh, I did want to add sure. on there that um, today there, there's implants are, are not prescription uh, products. Uh, like like some of the antibiotics on the market, there's not a requirement for a prescription uh, to to um, purchase or or use implants in the marketplace today as well. Perfect. I believe we've got them all uh, pretty well answered here. I, I thank you guys so much. If either one of you uh, has any closing comments you want to make, I know um, Dirk, you were able to make some closing comments there, but happy to have a closing thought. I, I know I learned a lot through this. I know there's been some ag trade media out and some extension publications now that this uh, FDA guidance has been out for a few weeks. So uh, there are some good pieces out there and um, I appreciate you guys referring back to the, the source on your slides because that's, that's the best place to go and uh, to experts like your veterinarian or your consulting nutritionists that work on this stuff day in and day out. Josh, I'll just make a couple of closing comments. Uh, first, we appreciate you taking time to join this webinar. Hopefully that provided some clarity. Um, you're right, those are public documents. Feel free to refer back to them. Um, if you have any questions or can't find them or would like help accessing those, um, hopefully um, you are uh, um, can get in touch with your your local Zoetis rep to uh, to contact them. They can reach out to us. Obviously, if you have a consulting veterinarian or consulting nutritionist you work with, um, they can be a great source for for information as well. Um, and, and by any by all means, you're welcome to reach out directly to Dr. Birkin or myself. Um, can um, Josh? I don't know if there's a way to provide contact information. Um, you know, through the follow up when you send out the recordings, um, but we're obviously uh, there, there's you, you can you can probably Google about anybody and find them these days, but uh, happy to help out in any form or fashion, but certainly appreciate y'all's time um, and hopefully provided some clarity, happy to follow up as needed. Yeah, and we will, the questions that came in that uh, that had a little more, were a little more specific in nature, we'll forward those on to you. Uh, Brian and Dirk, so you guys can see that. And we do the way the system works with the registration. It does tie it to the email of the person that sends it. So we can communicate those to you. Uh, so if you want to follow up individually with some of those individuals. And of course, uh, through our producer Ed email where you get information about webinars, you can uh, you can reply back to that with further questions or comments. And we're happy to take those. Thanks everybody for uh, a great webinar and again thank you to Zoetis for putting together some great information for us and we hope to see you all at summer business meeting have a great evening good night